Mr Margus Falcher, good afternoon and welcome to the University of the Highlands and Islands. Some of you have been here before, I know some haven't. Um, my name is Gary Campbell, I'm the key account director here and my job in UHI is to speak to the outside world, the non-student side, it's employer engagement and, uh, and community engagement and just generally explain to folk how the university, which of course is a huge area from Unst in the north to Campbelltown in the south, out to Murray and, and Perth and everywhere west from that, uh, how we can work with the various communities and various employers and also maybe what they can do for us at times as well. Um, with that in mind, uh, I'm delighted today to be speaking to Bob Davidson of Sandstone Press, who is uh, based in Dingwall, or as he says, he's based in the Highlands, which I think is a probably a better way of putting it. And one of the things I'm delighted about this is that this is a business that's based close by here with a global reach, which um, really, from our perspective, is the kind of things that we want to see and certainly the Highlands wants to see. Bob, just thank you very much for coming along. Thank you very much for inviting me. If you're a, an engineer by profession, yeah. you know, and um, now you're running a publishing company, what happened? How, d how, did, this, how did this come about? Such a good question, and I'm not entirely sure of the answer, to tell you the truth. It was a long transition. I was 33 years in civil engineering. I started an apprenticeship at the age of 17 and came out four days after my 51st birthday. Uh, I'd been 20 years in the water industry in the north, and water was always my favoured form of civil engineering. Um, but I got the chance to, to leave at a fairly early stage, and uh, circumstances, chance at that time, had made me not particularly responsible for other people, a, a single middle-aged childless man, by chance. Uh, but that allowed me to pay off my flat and be poor. I had enough money so that I could afford to be poor, you know? So we're not talking about destitution, we're talking about low income. I, for example, I was 10 years without a car. So you uh, could get by, this is what you're saying. That was the point, I yes. had enough money to get by. Yep. And uh, I, I took three months out not doing anything and thinking of getting a job, but then at the end of the three months I thought, no, I won't. I'll sit down and write, and I wrote another book, which wasn't published again, like so many of mine, nearly published, but not published. Uh, and I now much know much more about what that word means, of course published. Most people who write books and want to be published actually don't know what it means, what the implications are, where you're going. It's enough to have this object in your hands and then everything will just fall into place. But it doesn't necessarily. So I did that and after, after another year, a magazine which I'd appeared in as a writer very often um, was possibly going to go out of the game. That was Northwards and my great friend Angus Dunn, who was the second editor after Tom Bryan, had decided after a long time and taking it a long way to, to go on and do other things. And I stepped forward. And what did Northwards, what was its purpose at the time, Bob? Northwards purpose at that time was a new writing magazine. It had been set up, oh, 15 or 20 years before. Mm -hmm. I was a frequent contributor. Uh, and it encourages, it's part of that Scottish matrix with Creative Scotland, forming the Scottish Arts Council at its heart, which is encouraging the literary arts and more recently, the literary business in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And a lot of work has been done over the years in encouraging writers to write, to meet in writers' groups, and to publish in such magazines. Most countries in the West have such magazines. They're very rich in America. Uh, America's very rich in them, I should say. Nobody in magazines is very rich. Uh, but Angus, Angus uh, was standing down, and I saw, I think, opportunity. I'd been involved in publishing books, I had my own books published, and I'd done a job, a proposal I'd made to Scottish Cultural Press in 1998 about a book which I'd, I'd worked through, and this was the beginnings of thinking about things like business, thinking about things like typesetting and design and, and, and moving on, and then I took on Northwards and did it very differently from Angus and moved it from being uh, a magazine with the writer at the centre of it into a more general Scottish arts magazine with colour, I managed to get increased funding, uh, and pointed it at the market, at people who would want to buy and read such a magazine, so I tried to determine what people would want, mm -hmm. and then, and did that, make it a general arts magazine, so we covered the visual arts, we, we still had new writing in it, but we commissioned uh, professional writers to produce material. We had a partnership with um, Highland Printmakers, then Art TM on the banks of the Nest, just, just a bit downstream and on the other bank from here. And 
produced this and worked on it and had all the copies delivered to my house and distributed them from the house and sent out invoices from the house and tried with conspicuously small success to get the money back in. If we tell me how many, so how many magazines were getting delivered to your house every month? We upped, well a thousand, we, uh, we upped the turnover in, in uh, 12 issues from about 200 to about 900. And do you think that the, the change, clearly the change in the focus, circulation, should say. The, yeah. change, the change in focus, you know, from being something where people just wrote and had their, and what their writing published to you moving it to more something that people wanted? I implicit in that decision is the decision to try and get it out, is, is to spend the money and try to get money back in. Mm -hmm. And amongst the lessons that were learned is that you need a distributor. You need a professional to do it for you. You can't keep that in-house, certainly not <coughs> literally in-house. So in, in 2002, um, I founded Sandstone Press. I had, I had a headhunted uh, fiction editor, which was Moira Forsyth, uh, poetry editor, which was Rhoda Michael, uh, reviews editor, which was Colin Dunning, and the Gaelic editor, which was Angus Peter Campbell. You might know Moira and Angus Peter because of reasonably well-known names. Uh, and so you, so, so this is Sam, but, but Sandstone Press publishes books. So what, what led from going from you know, running the magazine, of you made it much more customer focused, into a general arts magazine, through to then wanting to pub, you know, publish books? Books are, are, are where you want to go. It's, it's what people mostly want to read. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the more adventurous thing to do. It's the, lar it's the larger scale projects. It's the obvious thing to do, Gary. Okay. Yeah. The idea was to be, if we could, well, first of all, it was a space for projects to do things, right? And amongst the early decisions, was not to go on a not-for-profit basis. And that was part of the learning from Northwards magazine because that is rather limiting in what you can attempt. Mm -hmm. Better, I thought, to seek profit, to form a profit-seeking company, seek funding as well, mm -hmm. uh, but to seek profit and then reinvest and expand and be free. Mm -hmm. And there was always was this, at that time, mad notion to be something like Canning Gate in Edinburgh, but here growing out of these sensibilities and this landscape. And that seemed mad at the time, but we're, we have the shape and we've got the outreach and we're very far short of uh, Canongate size at the present time and reputation, but it's it ceased to be a ridiculous idea. But I think, but isn't that interesting because then you had that... Yeah, oh, incidentally, we're, we're very great friends with, with, with Canongate Publishing. There's a very warm relations between the two companies. Isn't it, is, do you think it's important that you had that vision at the outset? Yes. Yeah, this is how you, this is how you're setting yes. out your stall. Uh, at times along the way, there's been opportunities to go in other directions and, and to lower ambitions, but that that has remained. Okay. Yeah. And at that time, I mean, you, you've got your own book here, Site Work, which yeah. is which, having read it, is a <laughs> is a very very graphic description of what it's like to work in a, as a as an engineer, yeah. uh, literally in the holes at times, you know, and. Uh, and so you publish your, your, your own book, you publish other stuff but, and other books, but then it comes to this book, you know, this, this which is a tremendous book, Amy Sherifi, and it's a, it's a book about um, a refugee coming to Scotland. And this is really, this is probably one of your first moves out with the Highlands or people you know to, to this, this lady in this book, is that correct? Yes, uh, if we can have that one, please. I'll give you, I think it's the company you want to talk about, it's happy to do that. But before I do, this book came much later. Uh, it's, a, it's a cry from the heart from me. There's 33 years of civil engineering experience in there. It took me 12 years to, 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 uh, to author it. I determined that they, at the start of the company that no editor would ever publish their own book. That's, that's a rule that's gone by the way. But I wanted to put that down and put that out uh, into the world. And I have to say, I don't regret it. It is, to me, an important statement. And other people have said flattering things and it's washed its face financially, so I'm happy with that. This book actually comes before it, and this is, depending how you look at it, one of the most important books in the company, and certainly one of the most important books in my life, and I believe it's one of the most important books that have been published in Scotland for, for many a long year. And the route goes for the company goes like this. We kicked off in that amateur, part-time world, with a view to becoming full-time and professional, which we, we now are, right? And we kicked off with, because, you start a journey, you can only start the journey where you are, 
and you're never really sure where you're going to end. Even if you have a destination in mind, you're never really sure you're going to get it, but you know where you are. So we kicked off with poetry pamphlets, you know? But now we don't publish poetry and don't, at the moment, publish short stories because they don't sell. But we published two sets of three poetry pamphlets. This let me give, and I commissioned the, the editors, the, the, the Northworld's editors, to meet the authors, to do the edit, and that got them early experience out with the magazine. And we actually, I get a demand a round of applause for this one, we made a profit on poetry pamphlets. That's, that's not bad, you know, no, no one does. We moved from there, much thanks to Moira and connections she has in this area, into adult literacy. And we developed a series of books, which were called the Sandstone Vista series. We published three, four, four tranches of, of, of three. And uh, they were aimed at the education market, but that part of education, which is teaching adults who do not read well to read. And the people were coming forward all the time. They were called, they were called emergent readers at that time. That's, that term has fallen out of favor, but uh, it, it, it's a good one to, to my mind, it, tell, it tells you. And you might be surprised, I don't have the, the document with me, I usually carry it everywhere, but uh, in British, Scottish terms, but also British terms, there are approximately 25% of the population, that's a quarter, if you didn't, <laughs> it's a bank of evil, no, uh, of the population cannot read well enough to get by. And they will have developed survival strategies for buying in supermarkets and the likes. 25% of the population. Our prisons That's still the same today, is it? Yes. yes there's yeah. a recent report last year. Yeah. Our prisons, uh, every word in this statement is considered, our prisons are full of young men who cannot read. It's a significant thing in our society. It became almost fashionably um, conscionable not long ago, and we managed to get funding, and we moved into the field, and we did wonders. Eventually, we had to move out because a larger company, and I salute them, managed to do it much cheaper and put many more books out, and we couldn't live with the price. So we come out. By that time, to come in this direction, Gary, yep. I'll happily take questions on adult literacy, if you want. Uh, we, I decided uh, to go into non-fiction. But this time, the other shareholders, apart from Moira, had gone, and in 2005, Moira and Ian Gordon, whom people know, had become directors, and from that day to this day, there are three directors and, and three owners. One of my little things, by the way, is I'm very proud of is the people who bought in at the start got a little bit more money when they sold out than, than, they, than they put in, and that was an, a nice point to me. Um, we had moved into the adult literacy, and I wanted to meet people who, had, uh, who were using our books, not the state operatives, not, not officials, but people on the ground. And we managed to meet a gentleman whose name I'm not going to mention, uh, uh, with a, a woman whose name I will mention, whose name is Jo Haythorn Thwaite in Glasgow, at Watterson's in Sucky Hill Street down the stairs, and had a cup of coffee together. And this gentleman was an asylum seeker. He was also a civil engineer like me. Uh, and he was a Turkish Kurd. And his story uh, is, uh, would be an interesting digression, but I won't, I won't do it. It was a horrific story for him and his family. And we met these asylum seekers and we were, later we were around the table, the three of us, wondering what to do. And Ian came up with the idea, why don't we tell his story, Bob? You can do it because you had worked with Brian Irvin on one of his biography, autobiography and, um, uh, for the Vista series, the 12,000 word autobiography from a famous footballer. And the gentleman wanted to do it, but his wife asked him not to because she couldn't go back and relive that experience. We were working, we've now met Remzia Sharifi, who is an Albanian Kosovar who escaped in 1999 and by this time was um, a development officer with the Maryhill Integration Network in Glasgow. And at that time, and I think still, the Maryhill Integration Network is the most advanced such organisation in Britain for dealing with refugees and asylum seekers. You may have seen pictures in the news of uh, a container lorry opening in near Trafalgar Square and people tumbling out, having paid everything they had to get there. And that's who we're talking about, not speaking English. They would typically be, be, sh be welcomed and shipped to various places, including Glasgow. Did she, so she, was she keen to tell her story for the other chat, wasn't it? We got to talking about it and she decided that she would. 
And Ian's family kindly gave me access to a flat in Glasgow and I worked through and we I worked with Rema on this book. Um, and the book, I say it who shouldn't, but the text is radiant. Uh, it's extremely important. And we did everything wrong in publishing that it's possible to do after the text. We've got the wrong kind of cover, which I think you'll agree looks a bit like a science fiction cover. We typeset it badly. The spaces between the paragraphs that shouldn't be there. But most of all, we try the decision was to you can't really sell the book unless you have the object in your hands. Nowadays, we're selling books in, our, or our selling agents of Faber and Faber are selling in 12 to 18 months in advance. So when we went into, I went into a shop like Borders in Glasgow, which existed at that time, in Buchanan Street, and say, this is a local book in a sense, stock it. They looked at me as if I was daft. So you, so and you I was. So at that time, you were essentially doing, you were doing all the back to what you were Still doing. Still trying to do doing everything. everything. yourself, the same as back to the story with the, with the magazine. Yes. Doing it all. Yeah, yeah and, and gradually coming away from there. And that, amongst the reasons this is important is it was content. They had two page spreads, incidentally, all across the Scottish press. It was shortlisted for the, at that time, the Scottish Arts Council uh, First Book Prize and also the Saltire First Book Prize. Very proud of it. Um, and uh, I was at a literacy meeting the following year and I spoke to a, a woman who had much more experience, or was at that time much more experienced than I am, I was, in publishing, and asked her what went wrong. And she very kindly wasn't too blunt. Uh, and after that, I went out my way to re-examine every single aspect of what we did from start to finish, from the covers, from the typesetting, to the marketing, to the lot. And, and so how did you how did you go about that? What did you do? I mean, there's for people in business, you know, it's it's sometimes difficult for people to admit that they've got they've, they've made mistakes, but also some it's also difficult for them then to go and find out how to fix it. You know, where to get the advice. What, yeah. How do you, I mean? You've you've talked about a number of things here: the covers, the typesetting, yeah. all these things, which all which are all essentially probably professions in their own right. Oh yeah. So how, how, what did you do then to then bring that expertise into, into Sandstone? I took such advice as I could from what was then the Scottish Publishers Association, now, now uh, Publishing Scotland, but I'd like to think for yourselves. I looked at books that had been published by successful established publishers whose name you'd recognise, and I saw a name at the bottom of the copyright page, which is not the name you'll find in here, but down in there, but it was uh, this name. Let's see if in this book. Yeah, typeset by Eolera typesetting Newton Moore, a chap called John Hewer. So, this, uh, this is, so all of a sudden, or, or all the time, there's a guy just the answer there, was there guys 30 the miles down the road. Eh? <laughs> so I went down and met John, and we formed a great working relationship, great friendship, and uh, we put almost all of our books, not the big designed ones like uh, the adventure game there, to John. And he types them and it types them and makes the ebooks, yeah, which have come in. I should say, incidentally, just by way of, of blowing our own trumpet, that we were the first publisher in Scotland to produce ebooks at all. They were going to be the coming thing, this, but this goes back to just the early, the early foundational days of the company when we were trying to sell through the internet through our website, and uh, ebooks were talked about. So I commissioned short work from the experience we'd had with Northwards and the experience we'd had with the Vistas. Short work from Ron Butlin, from Sahil Sadi, uh, poetry translation by Anna Crow from a Catalan uh, poet, uh, whose name had just slipped my mind. And we got our designer of that time to set them out on PDFs with the idea of people reading them off their laptops and sold them, or tried to sell them using PayPal mm -hmm. to people who would download them and be able to read them off their laptops. This was a commercial failure. Technically it worked, people just didn't want them. Artistically it worked, they're, they're beautiful. Every single item that I commissioned has been published by, by, by someone, some by us, some by, by, by other publishers. And the conclusion I came to at that time was that ebooks would not work until a reading device was developed that was something like a book. You'd open it up and it'd be something like that. Not your computer, not your laptop. Have you noticed that the, the different ways that computers has gone from the internal combustion engine? You know, the internal combustion engine went into a, a vehicle and it would look something like a stagecoach and it was called a horseless carriage. 
And from that time, from that point of start, you go to little sports cars, 16 wheel trucks, uh, Volkswagen Golfs, whatever cars you've got, uh, vans, all kinds of different things from the horseless carriage. But not so the computer. The computer starts off looking like a television, right, as th like there was the carriage before. But it remains looking like a television for most things, and we're all pouring more and more function into the one piece of kit. It's gone in different directions. But so, so back to your thing about the, the e-books, did you think about developing one yourself? No, we didn't have the money or the technology for that. We put it to one side and waited. Until someone else yep. brought, brought the vehicle out. That is correct. Yep. Uh, and other things were happening at the same time. Where was I? But just thinking about... Thinking less about cars and more about books, you know that the, <laughs> <laughs> the, no, the. So you've now got a publishing company you've, that is successful. You've got a range of authors. It's you're you're publishing books. You're waiting for the e-book revolution, and you've learned uh, you've learned you know from it sounds like from experience, but taking taking advice from others. Oh yeah. And. But within that. I mean, I, I mean, to me, I suppose that the important thing at the end of the day is the books, mm -hmm. you know, which are a, a, or, or the authors that you get. So when you, when, when you look for an author or, or you get approached by an author or you see somebody, what is it you look for in, a, in an author that would, um, that makes them special and makes them some, somebody you would work for, or work with, sorry? Uh, the, the first thing is the quality of the text. Can they write or not? It would surprise you how many people can't write, the, the, uh, uh, not like literacy, but write a, a narrative that grips and draws you in. There's a whole range of skills here. So that, that's the absolute first thing then, originality. And we've moved from looking for those things purely and being really quite pure and absolutely fair to the, the present time when we're looking at it more commercially, Mm -hmm. But also with our increasing reputation, agents from all over the world are coming to us with more commercial authors. We are still publishing people who uh, come to us from what is unfairly, and it's not a term I like, but you'll, you'll know it, it's the slush pile. Uh, and from them come some of our, of our most valuable authors, but fewer and fewer. Now, at an earlier stage, I asked when I was thinking, well, I'll start a different place. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2009, I felt it was time to go into fiction, and you shouldn't think this is, it's been rather Bob-centred at the moment. It's, it, by this time, it has ceased to become all Bob, and both Ian Gordon and Moira Forsyth then were put in massive amounts, and they would have their own stories to tell, and, and they're still doing that, and it, it increasingly so. But to go into fiction, to the following year, 2010, we published four novels, which washed their face, and I was out looking, which is what I do, for authors of a more established variety and I put word out and the word came back from Sheffield Hallam University, well from the professor of creative writing at Sheffield Hallam University, whose name is Jane Rogers, that she had a book that she would like us to consider. At that time the big publishing houses were becoming more ruthless and they were shaking <coughs> out what they call mid-range authors, which is people who sell 10,000 copies and looking more and more for the, for the J.K. Rowlings of this world, you know? Uh, and it was a wonderful book uh, called The Testament of Jesse Lamb. I read it and thought, what does an editor do with that? You say, thank you, Jane, you know? <laughs> uh, we had not gone to others because it's a bit crossover here. There's a reason, a reason to say no, is it young adult, is it adult? Well, it's adult expressed in a young person's voice, just the way that To Kill a Mockingbird is, you know? Mm -hmm. It's an adult book. Um, so we took that on. That was our fifth novel, and it was long listed for the Man Booker Prize. And That's an extraordinary thing. Does that I was working from my back bedroom in Dingwall at the time. Does that, I mean, not sounding sound trite about it, does that make a difference for you as a publisher? Huge. Yeah. Um, the, the strategy, broadly, has been to build a base of, of books and authors, because we're now publishing authors for three, four, five times. A base that we, that we can live on, accepting that luck happens, because it does, chance happens, it's publishing, That's mm -hmm. it does, and you get these spikes every so often. When the spike comes along, build on it, mm -hmm. you know? build on it. When the setbacks happen, say this little phrase that we say, it's, it's, a, it's a byword that sounds so impressive, most setbacks are for the best, you know? Mm -hmm. If you've got a disaster, it's too precious not to use. Um, what did you do? Uh, so, but that's, that's actually easier to analyze that than it is to analyze success. But the, uh, the Testament of Jesse Lamb, 
uh, was long listed for the Man Booker Prize, Gary, in 2011. And it was the day after my birthday, I was working away in my back bedroom, looking at old cars out there and working away, and the telephone rang. And it was a voice, and they said, congratulations, Bob. It's George Bulmer here. Maybe we shouldn't use his name. And uh, I thought, who's that? Amazon. George is at Amazon. Amazon don't call me. I said, I said well, thank you very much. What have we done? Lo lo Jane Rogers, long listed for the Man Booker Prize. I thought, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And we, we took it from there. The next, that changed my world. Oh, oh the other thing he said was, uh, we want the ebook now, tomorrow. We've been working on the ebook for three months, trying to work out ways of doing it. John Hewer, to his greater glory, put his head down and turned it around in 12 hours after working on it for months. And it was right. So well done, Mr. Hewer. Yeah, and uh, that, that changed our world more than somewhat. But the following day, another thing happened. Now remember, let me paint this picture of my back bedroom, which is a mess, and looking out into the back of the cars and things. The phone went again, and a, an American boy said, will you take a, vo a call from Mrs. Roberts? I said, certainly, who is that? Claire Roberts, Vice President, Trident Media, Madison Avenue, New York. Right? Would you like to take this author? I said, aye. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is now yeah. New York calling Dingwall back bedrooms yes, in Dingwall, eh? that's right. I think you've been doing pretty well by this, this point. Is, this, is, this, this, is, this is absolutely <laughs> remarkable. And, you know, things that do not happen, but it happened. Uh, and now Claire's a good friend, I should say. Uh, now we, g we go to three times a year to London, at least. We go to uh, London Book Fair and we go to, I go to Frankfurt Book Fair. London Book Fair, uh, two sales conferences at Faber and Faber, which we're going to come to, Gary. Uh, and um, Moira and I were treated to a dinner uh, in a very nice expensive restaurant by, by Claire Roberts of, of Trident Media. This is how your world can change like that, you know? And, and it's you go for the quality, you go for the work, and when the luck happens, you ride it. And, but I actually don't like that term. I, I say that Samsung Presses, it's this experience here, by the way. It's a building thing, you know? It's not evolutionary, it's not explosive, it's a building thing. You're taking the building blocks together and if they don't, f don't fit, put them away. If they do fit, build, that, that, that's how it works. And these relationships matter so much. And you know, from, from this, the, this is you now established. And I mean, the, the, you know, the, the you've been subsequently, y your authors for your books have been listed and, and won, you know, yes, many prizes, right. which, which, which is a tremendous testament, obviously, to, to all the work you've put in, you know, and, and continuing to do. But, you know, you mentioned your favour and favour there. You've talked about Canongate already, you know, and, yep. and, now, and now you're talking about your Trident Media, people like that. Yes, right. So there's, there are lots of these big guys out there. Yeah. That, and here's you with a, with a successful publishing business in the Highlands, yeah. running at this time, as you see, out of your back bedroom. So, and you're listed, you're, you're, you're Amazon's calling you, so how do you then compete in the marketplace with these guys that have got vast resources? It's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, and many of the authors and the agents uh, who come to us would like us to do more. Well, we do all we can, and, 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 and we're growing all the time. Uh, let me go back to 2011 when um, Jane was long listed for the Man Booker Prize. I'd been looking, we had been looking for, because Ian was highly involved as well, uh, in uh, for, for people to represent us, to sell us. That, that aspect of it's not just the distribution, it's actually selling into the shops. So you've got that aspect of the books are, are printed and they go to a distributor and the orders come into the distributor and the books go out with an invoice and the money comes back and they take their cut and they send the money on, yeah. Uh, but selling agents, if we can't go in and actually ourselves if we can't and sell the books, people who can do it, you need, you need them. And I had an ambition from the start because I remember Canongate, my hero, Faber, actually above them, because in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, you're into the world of the unbelievable. I met the Canongate editor in uh, the end of the book festival we'd, we'd agreed to meet, and um, to discuss about the future of the Testament of Jesse and Lamb. And we now continue to publish that about the partnership with Canongate, that, that one title. Uh, and what I, I said was uh, we could go into business here, but we're really looking for selling agents and you know, you, you know the independent alliance at Faber uh, and we'd like to join them. I don't know how ridiculous that is, by the way, because of the scale, the size and scale. And uh, Francis said, well, no, but something else has happened. And as soon as I was in touch with Will Atkinson, that had now left Faber, and uh, they were going to do it again. Now, about 12 years ago, 
Faber, I think it was Will Atkinson, recognised that it was difficult to get even their books on the shelves at Borders and Waterstones and the likes, right? And a larger organisation would be better, so they set up the Independent Alliance, which was ten, I think ten, publishers, which included Carnegie and Serpent's Tale and Quercus and Atlantic. This is a lot of sp essentially yeah. smaller guys getting S together. Yeah, but still a lot bigger than us, Scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and with the one sales team, and they're not just to chosen at random, the lists are different and they sort of merge. Mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, and I want to be part of that because it's a great success. I felt that when Canongate had, I haven't asked them about it, but my feeling is that when the life of Pi happened to Canongate, you know, that was the Man Booker winner, that was transformational for them, I felt that they were ready for it. And if, we, if Jane had actually won the Man Booker Prize, which she was not successful in doing on that occasion, then we wouldn't have been. But we would now. Because Faber started Faber Factory Plus with another team of sales, which we were invited to join. Mm -hmm. And we were the first Scottish publisher to be invited to join. And it turned out that while I was tracking Faber, they were tracking us. Because we'd, we'd, we'd shown up on the radar. And we joined them, and that has continued, and it's an extremely successful uh, partnership. Uh, the Faber Factory Plus is now merging with the Alliance to become one team again, which is making it you, us even stronger. Yeah? It gave us access to other things. Uh, Ian West was the director, again, he's left us and that's moved on. Uh, earlier, the only strain we ever had in our relationship, which has been just about perfect, was he said, Bob, cover's not good enough. Yeah? And I had a commitment to Highland artists that's at, the, at the start to use them. And then Scottish. But then, sorry, we're trying to get into the mainstream. We have to use mainstream operatives Right, and uh, I met Maureen and I together when we were down there for the sales conference. We met Donna Payne. The advice that's come from Faber is fantastic, very generous. Met Donna Payne, the, the artistic director, and we talked about what makes it something commercial, what doesn't make something non commercial. And she gave us a list of designers, some highly established and extremely expensive, some up and coming. And that is the list we work for now. We've probably got, I'm not, I haven't counted them, eight or ten full-time professional cover designers. That's what they do. So Faber, so joining this alliance essentially has, has given you access to, the, to a lot of the facilities that a larger publisher would have yeah. as part of a group. Some, something else you mentioned there, and I mean, I'm conscious of time here and I'm sure people, so I've got some questions for you, but something you mentioned, you know, Amazon called you, which must be, it must be quite tremendous. You know, you've, you, you spotted the ebook, you know, thing before it, before it came along, but you were ready for it. And now, I mean, generally in the press, myself as a, as a non-professional, certainly in this area, but the impression you get is that Amazon are dominating the world of book sales. How does that work for you? You know, again, you know, so again, here we are. We're in the Highlands. You're based in Dingwall. Amazon are this global organisation. What's the relationship? Well, it's good. Mm -hmm. It's a good relationship, um, and we also have good relationships with Watersons and the wholesalers and the independent bookshops about the islands and we're putting pop-up shops in Eden, there's one Eden Court Theatre now, there's one in Dingwall High Street and we're talking about hotels with some hotels who will give them a good uh, a good discount and they will stock only our books, right? So mm -hmm. there's that level as well. But I, pr you know, I prefer to say the internet than Amazon. Of course you're right, it's Amazon. But you might ask yourself if it was always going to be Amazon. It's Amazon just now. But competition happens in our society. And they are, they are so incredibly dominant and they're also incredibly clever. Um, and they have a different ethos in terms of money uh, to most. They, they really are anxious to get those prices down for the customers and be the one outlet uh, for internet buyers. Well, that, I don't think it can last forever. So although I have very good relations with Amazon, I do see Apple striking back sometime, yeah, you know, or, or Google or, or, or someone else making a, a, a single website to, to compete and that'll be interesting how that how that eventually goes um but very they work, very they important what for you compared you know let's say compared to the waterstones or w smith the traditional stuff does it work for you to your benefit being with amazon as well or how do you mean to our benefit well you know is it is it so or would you do you find it as important or is it more important to be with amazon and, and selling on the internet rather than traditional sales? Our, our, our single biggest account is amazon by far okay uh, I think I, I don't want to talk about numbers, because, but at least not in absolute terms, but in percentages, I will. 
uh, I wish he was here for this one, but Amazon are probably doing 40 to 50 percent of our hard copy sales. But ebooks are getting stronger in when it comes to novels and cr you know, crime, this genre books, this kind of thing. Popular books, the big sellers. Ebooks are more and more popular. And uh, people will tell you, I think that the accepted figure is that Amazon are doing about 80 percent. In my opinion, that, that's, that's a conservative figure because you don't want to go about the embarrassing figure of 90% or more mm -hmm. going to Kindle. Almost all of our are Kindle, and, and we're not alone. So we, we're, Amazon are probably doing about 60% of our turnover, maybe a bit more. Ebooks, as such, over the, the past couple of years have taken 40, as I recall, 40 and 42% of our turnover, respectively. Two months ago, we had a less good month on hard copy and an exceptionally good month because it's, it's progressing on, on ebooks. And we had twice the turnover on ebooks that we had on hard copy. That was a first. It turned around radically, particularly. So, ebooks, people are continually saying ebooks, you know, it's a fad, it'll go. They're not. It's a good way to read, it's a good way to shop. And who do we serve? And we serve the customer, like anybody else who's got something to sell. That, you know, we, we, we have excellent relations, I hope, and I believe, with Creative Scotland, who have been good enough to fund us over the past few years. And thank you very much. Come back for more shortly, um, I hope. And I'll be lucky, yeah. And we, we have a strong relationship with Faber, and a strong relationship with Watersons, and I believe Amazon, although it's, it's a different sort of relationship. But who are we actually serving? And it's people who read books, who buy and read books. And we've got a duty to give them the books in the way that they want them and a the price that they can afford when and where they want them. And that's what we endeavour to do in all the fields, whether it's the e-books, which go to, um, not only to Amazon, but to Smiths and uh, Bowker and, and, and the state and, and others, um, and Watersons and independent bookshops. And so I was no bigger fan of independent bookshops than me, the Cayley Place, the Elpo Bookshop, uh, formerly Crispola, Crispola up at Durness, Achines at Lochinver, the Nairn Bookshop. I love them and I'm worried because we really don't want to lose them. They're real, uh, major cultural centres for us uh, and, on small local levels and they are threatened by this. But let's not say Amazon because if you wipe out Amazon, the internet is still there and people who want to buy will still be buying through the internet. Yeah. And I serve them and although I love the independent bookshops, and I know many of the owners. I don't serve them. I serve the same people as them, the customer. I wanted to draw your attention to this book, which is published by my friends at English Pen, not Scottish Pen on this occasion, but English Pen, and they're, they're, they're great people. And it's called Draw the Line Here, and I hope you'll go to your internet and go to the English Pen website and buy it. It's cartoons for the families of those who died in the Charlie Hebdo atrocity and in support of free speech. It's a long time since free speech was threatened in Scotland in this way, I think you have to go back to the Covenanters. And Robert, I remember Ro an essay by Robert Louis Stevenson uh, discussing a, a gruesome public execution of people who wanted to express themselves, the, the religious expressions, they were, they were, they were Covenanters. Um, Sandstone Press doesn't have a political viewpoint. The only one I allow, you know, we're not of the left, we're not of the right, we're not nationalists, we're not uni unionists. That's for the authors to do, and it's our job, amongst many other things, to amplify them and let their views get out, okay? This is by some wonderful cartoonists. January the 7th, these men were killed because they expressed religious expressions, which are anti-religious, and for some kind of them, that's just the same as expressing religious. In a sense, they died for us. We are in their business. I associate myself completely with them, if this sort of tactic works, we will not have places like this anymore or talks like this anymore and we'll all be afraid to speak. Please do buy the book, draw the line here, and remember to draw the line here. We all get to express ourselves without fear. Well, that was absolutely tremendous and thank you so much.